Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is you're having, have a good one. Uh, so this is Despina from Syros, Greece. I'm an amateur storyteller and an English teacher. And recently I have become a storytelling teacher. <laughs> this is not one of the stories I use with my students, however. It comes from Greek mythology. So I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Γι' αυτό έτυχε να γεννηθείς εσύ και εγώ για να σε συναντήσω. Γι' αυτό έγινε ο κόσμος μάτια μου, γι' αυτό για να σε συναντήσω. The song says that this is why we were both born, so that we could meet. This is why the world was built, so that you and I could meet. Long, long time ago, there lived a musician. He played several different instruments, but his favorite one, the best one, that really showed his talent was the lyre. When Orpheus, for that is the name of the hero, got hold of his lyre and started touching the strings. It was as if playing with the strings, he also played with the hearts of the people who listened. They say that if uh, he was playing close to nature, the birds would cease their singing and the trees would lower their branches to hear better. And if he was playing nearby a river, the fast flowing waters would stop and remain still, all the better to hear him. He was enthralling, people were enchanted listening to his music. Once, while playing, he locked eyes with a girl, and the girl was Eurydice. She was a fine girl to look at, and an avid listener to Orpheus's music, so they soon fell in love. And there is no better thing in the universe than the reciprocated love. They were so happy together, she would put her head on his lap and listen to him play his lyre for hours on end. They were so happy, it was only natural that soon they, they could get married, and they did. And the more merrier they were. But alas, a love like that, which is admired up to this day, well, it is also envied. And it was envy that broke them. Some versions of the story have the shepherd, others gave the beekeeper, others say it was Orpheus' best friend who felt lust for his wife. There was this competitor in any case who started making advances towards Eurydice, but of course she was too much in love with her husband to even pay him his wants. So she avoided him at first, but once he found the opportunity, he found the girl alone and isolated from everybody else and started making advances at her again and she wouldn't have it, but he became more and more persistent. So the girl had to flee. She started running and he was chasing after her. And as she was running, she went inside the woods and she was not looking at her way, where she was going, because she was so into escaping that she didn't pay attention to the viper. She stepped on it and of course the viper snapped and bit her on the ankle. And soon the girl was dead. When Orpheus found out, his heart broke in 1,000 pieces. He was inconsolable. He was not ready to depart from his beloved so soon. It was so early. He could not accept the idea. He had to do something. He had to do 
the unprecedented. He decided to go all the way down to the underworld and seek her and seek audience with the gods and try to bring her back to life. The only thing he took with him was the liar. So he started walking far, far and downwards. Far and further still he walked until he found himself in front of the great river Acheron. And there on the other side of the river, he could see the ferryman who started rowing his boat from one side of the river to the other. But when he reached Sophia's, the ferryman, well, he saw that this was no soul. This was no dead person waiting for him to pass him across. He was very much alive. So of course he told him off. He told him that he had no business there and that he should go back to the world of the living. But Orpheus simply sat down at the shore and started playing his music. And in all those years, it seemed like an eternity that the ferryman had been passing souls from one side to the river, of the river to the other. He had not once been entertained. And so sweet was the music, so divinely was the musician playing that when he stopped, the ferryman asked for more. And Orpheus said that, yes, he would play some more, if only he would take him across the river. So the ferryman did. Once he was across, he played a little more music for the ferryman's entertainment, and then he went on his way. And he walked far and further still and always downwards until he reached the great gates of Hades of the underworld, where Cerberus, the great big hound, the ferocious beast was guard. And of course, as soon as he saw the mortal approaching, he started growling with all three heads of his. But Orpheus, as you would have expected, simply took out his lyre and started playing. And as, he's, as he played his music, the beast calmed. It was soothed. It just stood there on the ground listening, placed all three heads on his paws and soon fell asleep. So he entered the world of the underworld and he kept walking far and further still and always downwards until he realized he was surrounded by shadows, the shadows of the people who once were, but were no more. It was like a flow that took him with it towards the thrones of the gods, Hades and Persephone. Hades, of course, was furious. What was this mortal doing in his realm, unwanted, uninvited? And unannounced. How dare he show himself like that in front of them? But Orpheus pleaded with the gods that they should at least let him explain why he was there. And out of curiosity, mostly, he conceded. So he took out his lyre and started playing the most melancholy music ever. And he started singing with his divine voice, songs of love, love like no other that had never been on the face of the earth before. And love that was so suddenly taken away from him. At the end of his singing, the God's eyes were filled with tears and Persephone reached out her hand and touched her husband's hand and such public display of affection. Well, it even softened Hades' cruel heart. So when they heard what Orpheus was asking, Hades looked at Persephone and she very, very quietly and modestly nodded. So he said that, yes, he could take Persephone back to the world of the living, Orpheus could not believe his ears. He had hoped for an audience, but this 
his wish was being granted. He could not believe it. They had invoked Hermes, the messenger of the gods and soul guide, to guide her through the underworld back to the world of the living with Orpheus. But there was one condition. During the trip upwards, Orpheus was never to return and check whether his wife was following. He would have to rely on the God's word. So he started walking far and upwards this time with Hermes and Persephone on the back following him. And he kept walking far and further still. Many a time he caught himself wondering whether his wife was truly there or whether it was a game at his expense played by the gods. And he did want to return and check if she was there, but he wouldn't, he didn't. He stopped himself several times. As they kept going further away, he could hear nothing. The underworld was long left behind them and he could not even hear her footsteps. So he didn't know. Curiosity was trying to get the better of him, but he held still until finally they reached the gates and he set foot on the outside, on the world of light. And at the same instant he did, he turned around to see Persephone was there, but he had not given her time enough to set her foot on the outside world. She was still inside. And the moment he turned to her and called out her name, Eurydice, my, my love, at that same instant, she was sucked back to the world of the dead. And the gates slammed on his face. He kept knocking on the door saying, crying out her name in bitter tears, but Cerberus, the beast started approaching again, growling, and it would not be soothed this time. Orpheus had to retreat. He had no other option but to let Charon, the ferryman, pass him across the river again. And soon he was all alone in the world of the living. He walked back to his place of birth and back to his music. But of course, there was no joy to be found in his music ever again. It was only melancholic tunes that came out of the chords of his lyre. But he was a changed man. The things he'd seen, the knowledge he had acquired back there, down there, he started living a very different life. He was a very talented musician still, and he had uh, many followers and many girls who were interested in becoming his partner after the end of his wife's death, but he was not interested in that. He was not interested in any of that. In fact, he started preaching. He started preaching a way of celibacy and abstinence of all pleasures and fasting. In fact, scholars later on say that it was the Orphic doctrine that paved the way for Christianity that was to follow in what was then pagan Greece. So he started preaching and he started having followers. More and more men would follow his example and they would avoid women. They would scorn them. But at the place where they lived, another great god was worshipped. It was Dionysus. And his priestesses, the Menads, they were wild. They would go out to hunt at night in the forest, not very sure of what they were hunting. And in one of those hunts, they got hold of Orpheus and he was done for. They tore him apart. They cut off his head and threw it in the river. And they say that as the head floated down the river, it was still singing 
songs of love for his beloved who would soon be with him again. And that was the end of Orpheus, end of the tale. Ευχαριστώ. Okay, thank you. That was very beautiful. Thank you for listening. Uh, I think that apart from the tragic love affair that still resonates to people's hearts, another reason why this is one of my favorite stories, luckily we have a treasure trove in Greek mythology, but this is one of my favorites, it's because it, because it talks about the feeling of loss. Here it is a companion, but it can be any kind of loss. And we as people, weak as we are, we cannot always manage said loss. Many times we struggle with it and we cannot come to terms with the finality of death. So I think that this really shows one of the agonies that have been tantalizing humans since time immemorial. Now, the, the story element of um, that someone is uh, not allowed to look back, that is a story element that appears in, in many legends and, and, myths and, and fairy tales. What do you, um, well, I guess it's, it's about the, the, that the character should have self-discipline and trust, uh, but, but do you have any other additional thoughts about what, what that is all about? Uh, Trust is what I had in mind because they allowed him the unthinkable and granting him such a huge favor that no mortal had ever had before or would ever have in the future. It was kind of insolent not to take their word. Mm. He had to show trust to the God's word and he didn't, he couldn't. No, kind of, not exactly, not as he should. So it was a, a sort of uh, ego. He, he, he was not humble enough. He was not trusting enough. He had too much ego. Uh, is that okay? I, I don't know if it's a matter of egoism. I think he was too impatient. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> mm. uh, may I say something? I think if it was a lack of, lack of trust, he would have yeah. looked behind even earlier. But then once he reached the shore and saw that he was away from Hades, he forgot that she would take longer because she was following, mm. she was following him. Yeah. And so just that impatience, that impetuousness is what did him in, mm. made him turn. Excuse me, Janice or something? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh, I feel that's all about we think uh, that's human. Isn't it? Like I feel it shows the real human here. We are all impatient and uh, like uh, we are, it's uh, a flow in us that we have, uh, we can do such things. Mm -hmm. so, I'd like to add something here. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with what Dr. Yasil is saying. Um, I also feel that it is, uh, you know, when the curiosity gets the better of man, he want, when, 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 you're, when we are asked not to do something, so why should I not do it is something that pops up in our mind and uh, we probably want to test and see, I mean, if, if, is it okay? I mean, is it okay? Even though we know that the, you know, the results to that may not be great, the human mind is such that it wants to make the mistake. And I think that is what even Dr. Yasin uh, pointed out, that after all, we are all humans. So I think it is also the quest of the human mind to control these curiosities, to overcome these uh, feelings that we have in our mind, um, which has been uh, time and again uh, told in these folk tales for us. 
Thank you, Despina. Uh, that was such a lovely story that you brought in. Thank you so much. There was one element that I forgot to mention. Maybe it's kind of, well, it has its own value, I guess. I can add it now. When he returned, after he realized he had lost her for good, he wanted to end his own life, but he knew from the things he'd seen that had he done so, he would never be with her again, not even in the afterlife. Yeah. I think this exists in many religions and it shows us that we should not give up under no circumstances. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I, uh, I think... Go ahead. I think the story would uh, resonate with a lot of people now because so many people have lost near and dear ones because of COVID. And, you know, the past two years have been so tragic for a good lot of people. So this would really resonate. When I was um, 14, I lost my sister, who was a year and a half older than me. She died suddenly, tragically. Uh, so I wrote a play a couple years later about a brother who goes to find his sister in the land of the dead. And, you know, he, he asks her, you know, why, why, why did it have to be? And it goes on. But uh, that was part of my healing process. The brother was not able to bring his sister back and I was not able to bring my sister back. But there was some, you know, satisfaction, some relief. In, in being able to have a, uh, a, another meeting. It's in, therapeutic. <laughs> in fantasy, yeah. Okay. That's the value of literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let us uh, proceed. Uh, Lavanya, are you ready? Okay. Yes, uh, I am. Okay. Um, uh, please introduce yourself fully, and please tell us a story. Right. So, um, thank you so much for being here, and thanks to Eric for uh, giving me this space. Uh, today, I'm going to bring to you all a story that is very close to my heart. Uh, to some of you who might not know about uh, the epic Ramayana in um, India. I'll just give you a small gist of what it is. So Ramayana talks about the journey of the legendary hero Ram. So the story goes in such a way that Ram and his wife Sita are sent to the forest because of a family dispute as to who will get to the throne among the four brothers. The brothers are very, very close to each other, very, very dear to each other. But still Rama being the obedient son decides to go to the forest along with his wife Sita for 14 years. And now his brother Lakshmana decides to accompany him to the forest. And this had to happen because Rama has the job of killing the demon Ravana who abducts his wife. The story talks about what happens after they come back from exile, bringing into character a not very spoken about character from Ramayana, Lakshmana's wife, the brother who went along with Rama for 14 years of exile. Now, this story is something that you would not see in the regular Ramayana, as in the Valmiki Ramayana or the Tulasi Das Ramayana, which is very famous. And one thing that I would like to tell you all here is, this is a story which is etched deeply in the memories of the Indians for ages. You can find about 300 versions of this story across the country. Now, most of these kind of stories, which points out or uh, brings in the stories of these uns 
satsang heroes or heroines comes from the folk literature we call it the ram kathas so let me present to you the story that is very very close to my heart the wind the wind was carrying the fragments of the champak and the jasmine flowers the night was young and the moon was full and he could not but increase his pace to walk past the numerous rooms in the courtyards for he was going to see her after 14 long years she lay there in deep slumber she was fragile but yet sensuous the valley of her hips the voluptuous swell of her breasts and her red lips was beckoning him he bent down and he adjusted her sari and sash he looked at her charming face and as he brought down his hand to caress her forehead he was taken aback by the admonishing voice that he heard for she even in her sleep realized that there was a stranger a man in her room if my father hears this o oh stranger he will punish you if the king of this land comes to know of your presence here do you know what your punishment will be if my sister's brother in law hears of this o oh stranger he will not let you live why are you here haven't you heard the story of indra the man who longed for another's wife and he got an ugly body because he sought another's wife ravana lost his kingdom and he was killed i'm sure i'm sure you know all these stories and and yet you're here with this intent his heart pained pained to see these words come out of his beloved's mouth and that too in her sleep was he a stranger to her with king rama on the throne the court was held in glory the three brothers of rama were standing next to him ready to serve him hanuman was pressing the feet of rama and sugriva stood there humbly tambura and narada were singing and ramba and his troop was dancing the sages were all standing there blessing the divine couple the gods were very happy and they were showering flowers from the sky ayodhya was celebrating the return of their coronation prince who was here after 14 years of exile <laughs> sita looked at all the people who were present and then she shifted her gaze to her husband rama i have an appeal to make my lord lakshmana your brother has been separated from his wife for 14 long years and i think it is not right of us to hold him back here any longer he should go back to his wife now as if he was waiting for these words to come out of sita and to see his brother not in agreement lakshmana ran ran for he was going to see his wife urmila after 14 long years but then when he rushed to the inner chambers his enthusiasm faded for he heard her speak in her sleep my great family's name is tarnished now helpless me what can i do the family of my birth is blemished helpless me what can i do don't you have a mother or stranger were you not born with sisters why why would you ever come to me with such an intent and it pained lakshmana to see his wife so vulnerable 
the words they were deeply etched in her subconscious and it just came flowing the moment she felt threatened he went on quickly to say i am rama's brother ah huh? never heard of that name i am i am the son in law of janaka your father said he who on earth is he came the reply lakshmana was shocked beyond belief to hear this coming from his devoted wife and a properly behaved daughter in law of a noble family yes she was talking in her sleep but that sleep did she ask for it lakshmana's mind trailed back to a distant memory the day when rama decided to leave to forest with his wife sita lakshmana insisted that he will accompany his brother and sister in law to protect them urmila asked lakshmana i will also accompany you but lakshmana simply said that he had his duties towards his brother and she towards his family <laughs> lakshmana stood guard in the forest day and night resisting sleep not battling the eyelid even for a second and that is when he had a strange visitor the goddess of sleep nidra devi we call her she came to him and she said you can't send me away lakshmana i am here to do my duty i should put you to sleep now but lakshmana refused if you wish to send me away if you wish to send me away you will have to show me someone who would swap their waking hours with your sleeping hours he didn't even think for a second urmila go to her my wife he said and did urmila have a choice she was there sleeping still not aware of the 14 years that had passed by and that her husband was back not aware that rama and sita were sitting on the throne ready for the coronation nobody nobody had bothered to wake her up they had just left her to her fate is this the real urmila who has freed herself from the burdens of her life as a wife freed herself from the shackles of the family life a woman finally free to speak for herself has she harbored deep resentment against all those who kept her under their rules taking away her joy and her freedom and making her utterly helpless <laughs> she probably felt that she was the lowest of the tatum pole her father Her father had married her half to a man who could not stand up for his wife's desires. Ha! Huh? Rama, he was busy keeping up his promise, and her sister Sita, she very beautifully managed to convince everybody that she needed to accompany her husband to the forest. Clearly. <laughs> everyone had their priorities set right except her it was only under the veil of deep sleep however she was able to show give an expression to all the repressed anger that she had inside her which she otherwise would never be able to do not when she was awake not when she took on the responsibility of the daughter in law of a noble family hot broken lakshmana tried to convince and wake wake his sleeping wife 
we are back we are back urmila we are back victorious and your sacrifice did not go waste my dear it was only because of your sacrifice i was able to kill meghnath the son of ravana who had a boon that he could be killed only by a man who had conquered his sleep it was because of the sacrifice you made my dear it was because of you that we were able to save your sister from the clutches of the demon ravana it was you urmila she was there unmoved still sleeping lakshmana's heart shattered finally he made a pathetic appeal please accept me urmila after all these years if you're going to shun me away my dear i will lose all the good name that i have earned in this world please accept me my dear forgive all that that i have done and accept me because without you i will not be able to live in this world for a single moment so saying he just took down took out his sword to kill himself urmila got up shocked stunned from her sleep to see her husband's lakshmana's eyes filled with tears it was at that time that the queens lakshmanas and rama's mother walked in they walked in seeing the distressed couple they gave them a relaxing bath the mother dressed up her daughter in law and her son in silk and jewels sumitra the other mother made them sit and serve them food in a golden plate while sita her sister combed her hair and shanta her sister in law took off the evil eye from urmila with sita shanta sumitra and kausalya showing their undivided attention on urmila she retired to the quarters with lakshmana the wind was carrying the sweet fragrance of the champak and the jasmine flowers the night was young the moon was full just like urmila's smiling heart thank you outstanding as usual lavanya so many emotions and you know your style of telling i didn't know this story so i have to look it up now thank yes, you the story is from the uh, land of andhra pradesh it is a folk tale a folk mm-hmm. ramayana from the land of andhra pradesh it is sung by women that is the mm-hmm. most interesting part of it So this you would not find in the regular Ramayana, like I told you. Mm-hmm. It has. Uh, this is called the song of Urmila's separation or Urmila's lament. You know, when when we all focus on the greater characters of Ramayana, that is this one little thing, unsung hero uh, or heroine, and I think um, it's very important for these women in Andhra because it talks about what. goes through the subconscious of a woman you know the vulnerability the helplessness everything is brought into picture and this spoke uh, also ends with the saying that anybody who listens to this ramayana this song version will get a place in the feet of the lord so that's how they end it what i really liked about this was how a woman was given her voice during her sleep how they talk about the subconscious through uh, the story and this was not something which was written in the recent years it was written very very long time ago so it is amazing to see how the 
folk author had managed to capture this part of the story, you know, and bring out the voice of the woman through Urmila. That fascinated me so much. Okay. And, what, um, what was yeah. she saying in her, in her sleep? What did she say? So she was actually asking questions. Uh, she was not able to even recognize her husband. It was like she had this resentment inside her as if her voice was not heard when the decisions were made. Um, you know, when, when there is a question that was asked by the goddess of sleep to Lakshmana, that you will have to show me a person who would give the waking hours to you so that you could stay awake and guard your brother. He simply said, Urmila, go to Urmila. So there are two things like, was it the understanding between the husband and wife that Urmila took off whatever Lakshmana said? Or was it the girl was never given a choice? Was she taken for granted? So this is something that is always under discussion and it comes into picture through this story. It's a very beautiful tale of how a woman's voice or anybody's voice is, uh, we, we talk about dreams. I'm sure Eric has done a lot of research on dreams. So we talk about dreams and sleep and how it just wakes up our subconscious and we try to bring in all that is stored inside our head through these. So one more interesting thing that I found in this story is how all the women in the end come together to, you know, give her that support that she needed. And that is why this was a woman's song that was sung, you know, where all the women gathered together and they sang this song. It was like reinforcing to the women community that we need to be there for each other, uh, to care for each other at any circumstances. So the song ends with how the mother-in-law, the sister-in-law and her sister come together to give her that, uh, you know, that assurance that we are there for you. So don't you worry. So that was another important and beautiful thing that I found um, in this story. So I'm open to listening to what you felt or what you have in mind too. Yes. Go ahead, yeah. Lalitha. Yeah, I know the story, but uh, as usual, I'm spellbound, Lavanya, the way you bought the story uh, again. And yes, there are so many things which uh, which we can take away from this story. Uh, I've heard the song also. And um, yes, it, uh, it can be interpreted as a love between the husband and wife, the understanding when he says, yes, Urmila will sleep instead of me. Or it can be also taken as he's taken her for granted. And yes, the way she gets her answers through sleep, it's so beautiful. It's like, I never thought about the subconscious mind, but the way you bought it, I, I really feel it is, it may be because subconsciously she really wanted those answers and she got them. And always I've heard many versions when people say that Urmila's sacrifice was more than when you compare it, actually you can't compare, but when people say that Urmila's sacrifice is more than Sita's sacrifice, in a way, I also felt it's true. And uh, the way you bought this, like how she asks these questions and how he feels that what he has done is wrong and how all the women come together to dress her up. It's so beautiful. I really loved it. Thank, Thank you. you so this was my version of uh, um, the subconscious part was something that I related to yeah. the story and I thought I should get it. Yeah, Thank you, this is something, this is subconscious thing is what I didn't uh, know. I didn't read. So you brought it out very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, yes, and the other thing that was so beautiful about this story is she's unmoved when he's trying to even give her the accolades, you know? It is because of you that I was able to do this. It is because of your sacrifice that I was able to do this. She was unmoved. She said, I know this will come up. It was uh, when I was reading, when I was trying to understand the story and trying to understand what deeper thoughts could have been inside this, what I thought was, all this is something that I will hear, but I need to hear something different. And then when he makes that pathetic appeal, telling that, accept me, don't shun me away. 
So that is when she realizes that, yes, the husband actually has heard what her mind has and she chooses to get back with him. So I thought that part was also very strong uh, for me in this story. Thank you so much. When people actually tell Ramayana, uh, there is this back story of Meghnath and he, his um, uh, boon that he has to be killed by a person who's conquered sleep and that is why all these stories are interconnected but right. when you look at it from Urmila's perspective and then and when she when the thing which you just now told she was waiting to hear that that plea from her husband this is so beautiful this this angle is very beautiful and I've read somebody's message that um, all women in Ramayana seem to be suffering no it's not like that there is a reason for everything. Uh, right. In, uh, you have to you have to know the whole story for that. Yeah. To me, Ramayana is all about connecting the dots. So you will see where everything is connected and it is woven into a beautiful, uh, you know, whatever you want to see. And uh, that is what it is. I mean, with respect to folk authors, they do not uh, look at, you know, uh, to them, they just need to create a story that is satisfying in their heads. So the author who created this pro story probably need answers, needed answers to what Urmila would have gone through, what would have her expectations be. So he tried to address, he or she tried to address this using uh, this story. And the same Andhra version also has this one small part called... Um, Lakshmana's laughter. So this actually starts off this the story that I narrated to you is actually a continuation of that. So it's that when Rama Sita were all sitting for ready for the coronation, Lakshmana laughs, suddenly laughs. And everybody is intimidate, intimidated by Lakshmana's laugh because they feel that they are Lakshmana is laughing at them. And uh, Rama asks Lakshmana, so what makes you laugh now? Why are you laughing? And then he suddenly recalls the episode with Nidra Devi. And he says that, you know what? I have uh, gone through this with Nidra Devi and I asked her to go to Urmila. And she told me that after this 14 years of exile, she's going to come back to me and relieve Urmila. I'm laughing at that because if she is going to relieve Urmila now, then I would be the one who's going to go to sleep. So it also leaves you all with a question in mind that when Urmila wakes up, will Lakshmana go to sleep again? So that is that is unsaid, you know, that it is an open, uh, open ended story that the author leaves you to your imagination. And all these is a, uh, these are all the part of that folk uh, touch, you know, these are the folk touch to the story. They don't look at bringing in the story as such. They just look at finding answers to questions that are not told. And that way it is so beautiful and I think it will resonate with every woman when he or she listens to this story. Thank you, Eric, for giving me the time. I don't want to take much of your time. I'm waiting for the Thank next you. teller to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Prisha, did you want to say something? I see your hand is up. Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to first of all say, ma'am, that was a very, very beautiful story, quite unlike uh, anything before especially me being from English honors, we have done Ramayana, but we never learned about such a very important part that is, you know, being, you know, washed away. And also the fact how Urmila only through the unconscious is able to talk about the generations of women whose sexual desires or desires in general have been repressed and how language fails women because language doesn't accommodate their desire right. and how true that it's been there and also the consent factor how Lakshmana very casually just puts out her name through similar how in Mahabharat uh, Draupadi's name is put out. So like these kind of questions really really are very fascinating and also makes many young children like myself think about all these stories that are reiterated through different people. So thank you so much. Thank you, Prisha. My pleasure. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And um, now we'll proceed to the next story. And that will be told by Veena. Veena, are you ready? Can... Yes, I am. Yes. Okay, please. Um, Introduce yourself, tell us the title of your story, and please tell us a story. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, wonderful people over here. 
two very strong stories, so I hope my story will touch your heart too. I am a retired preschool teacher, primary school teacher, and my storytelling reaches the underprivileged at government schools. So I like to raise their self-motivation and English language through storytelling. So there I am. Here's my story. It's about accepting differences. Well, it was a big, big jungle. Let me tell you, I was a preschool and primary school teacher. There was a big, big jungle. And in that jungle, there were big trees, dense trees. And with those trees, under those trees lived many animals. Come on, which animals? Lion, tiger, some peacocks, rabbits, some monkeys chirping on the trees. Even the crocodile in swimming in the river. But in that jungle lived a big herd of elephants. Elephants that were big, huge. Elephants that were almost always gray or blue in color. Elephants that were fat. Elephants that were thin. Elephants that moved their trunks and elephants that moved swayed their flapping ears. Mummy elephants and auntie elephants. Young elephants and old elephants. Well, all kinds of elephants were just there in that big herd. But amongst those elephants, there was one very special elephant. Close your eyes and here comes the special elephant. And he was Elmer. Elmer was a very, very colorful elephant, a patchwork elephant. He had all the colors in him. He had the yellow, he had brown, he had black, he had purple and white. All the colors of an elephant. Wait a minute, Elmer, said one little elephant, you look different. You're not the same color as us. Look at you. You're a patchwork of all those different colors. Where did you get those colors from? But Elmer just shooed them away and he flapped his ears and he threw some water on them with his big long trunk. Yes, I'm different. I'm different. I know. But do you like me? Do you like green? Or do you like red? Or do you like the yellow? Elmer, aren't you going to play with us? Called out some of his friends. Of course I am. Elmer, be careful, said his mother. And there was Elmer here and there and everywhere in that herd of elephants. But some of them were always nagging him and troubling him and said, wait a minute, Elmer, you're different. Go there. Elmer, you've got so many colors. You're not like us. Go there. Elmer, there. Elmer, not with me. I don't want to play with you. And one day, one day, Elmer thought to himself, I'm different. Why do I have all these colors on me? Where did I get all these colors? And so he walked away from all of them and he went into the jungle. Thump, thump, thump. Softly, thump, softly. He didn't want the other elephants to see him going. But as he went through the jungle, the lion called out to him, Hey, Elmer, look, where are you going? Elmer put his head down and walked away. The chirping chimpanzees and the monkeys from the top said, Elmer, Elmer, hello. He just looked away and he walked. He saw the big giraffe straining his neck and asked him, Elmer, where are you going? He looked away. And he walked 
and he walked and he walked deep into the jungle. And as he walked, he kept on thinking, why am I different? What can I do? And just then, he saw a big bush, a big bush of blueberries. And he shook that tree. He had an idea. He shook the tree. He shook it. And all the berries fell on him, soft and plump. And he chewed on them, just like Moira is chewing on something. And he found, those berries, Moira, are these yummy? I'm sure they are. And Elmer chewed them too. And he loved the color of all those berries. And they turned him blue. Just like all the other elephants, he rolled in those berries. I hope, Moira, you're not troubled by me pointing out to you. It was just pure fun. And he rolled on those berries. And soon he changed his colors from the very, very colorful elephant into a normal blue elephant. And he walked back from the jungle. He was happy. Yay, I've become the same like everybody else. And nobody saw him. The lion, he just thought another elephant was going by. The giraffe was busy chew chewing. And the monkeys were busy chirping. In fact, when he reached back into his herd, he thought, why is there dead silence? Nobody is talking. Nobody is looking at each other. But they were all wondering, where is Elmer? That naughty little Elmer. Where is he? And so went a few days. In that herd, very silent, very quiet, the Elmer with a no patchwork of colors, the Elmer which was blue, the Elmer who was wanting everybody to look at him. And then he decided to do boom. <gasps> it took back all the elephants and they turned around to see who did that. Where are you? Is that you, Elmer? And then drizzled and rained and all that rain quickly washed off that blueberry blue that Elmer had colored himself and he was another patchwork Elmer again. But then this time everybody was so happy to have him back. And just like that, my story changes. And as we were sitting, cousins, girls and boys and aunts and uncles, and everybody was sitting for a gathering, maybe a birthday party. My niece, Nandini, was also sitting amongst us. But she sat alone on the chair. And there was so much of chatter and conversation that was going on in that room. Nandini also felt, I have to be one amongst all of you. And she uttered a few words sometimes. And we looked at her. Yes, Nandini, I like the way you've dressed up. Yes, Nandini, what did you say? Yes, Nandini, I know you're a very good girl and you can play language word games with your favorite aunt. And Nandini, was putting her head down. Uh, I, I, I want to say, uh, I go, I do work. Uh, I, Nandini was different. Nandini had the eyes of a Down syndrome child. The flat nose, the slanting eyes, the short stubby fingers. Her walk was not the usual walk like you and me or the children run. Nandini could not run. She could never swim. She could not play badminton or bat and ball just like the other children. Down syndrome children 
have very weak muscles and soft bones, and Nandini was amongst one of them. Well, she sat on that chair looking at everybody and with everybody, but she was maybe feeling a bit lonely now. She slowly grazed her feet on the floor and quietly walked into the room all by herself. I noticed that. Luckily, I'm her favorite aunt and we have lots of story time together. I gave her a few minutes and then I went to her room. Nandini, shall we play the word game that we always play on Zoom? Uh, okay, she said with her head down. And I began, elephant, t, t, Nandini, say a word with t. Uh, teacher, r, r, I have to say a word with r. R, r. And we continued the game. After some time, I asked her, Nandini, do you want to draw? Uh, uh, no, I know drawing. Not now. The sentences were not complete, but the meaning was there. She could use words. Her vocabulary was pretty good for a Down syndrome child of 20 years. And so time went by. Her mother called out, Nandini, Veena, where are you both? What are you doing in that room again? Nandini, shall we go out? Maybe lunch is served. Uh, uh, no, I no come. You go. Well, I tried. I give you five minutes, Nandini. Come back, okay? Come. I will wait with my plate. I won't eat till you come to join us all. And she came after a few minutes. She walked into the room. She sat right next to me with her plate. She loves food. We all know that. And Nandini came back into the room and everybody in the room was so happy. Where were you, Nandini? What are you doing with Veena, auntie? What did you do? Where were you? Have you cooked anything? So many questions for Nandini because she was the love of everybody. And as she sat right next to me, she wanted to know if I have cooked anything. And she asked, Veena, auntie, uh, uh, I like palak. Paneer. And I said, yes, I know that, Nandini, and I made it specially for you. And we're happy, just like Elmer came back to the herd of elephants on his own with his own colors. Nandini came back to the room with her own colors and her own demeanor. She was one of us. She was different, but she was one of us. And just like Elmer, and the elephants who celebrated an elephant parade where all the elephants dressed up in all their gorgeous colors. Down syndrome is also celebrated on the 21st of March every year, all around the year, all around the world. And that's when each one of us who is one among all is one different too. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Beautiful, Vinaji. Lovely parallel and so nice you brought out the two stories. Wonderful. So, who, who have you told that story before? I have just recently told that story to um, a ladies' group of 35 women. And I was wondering, I need to raise social awareness. So I asked my sister, legally, am I allowed to tell the story and bring Nandini into the picture and retain her name? Because if I give another name, I don't think I would actually relate to that person. And Nandini is 25 years old now. Yes, I'm her favorite storyteller teacher auntie because all along I have been going to her school and uh, and uh, telling stories at her uh, special education school. And 
there is a small cafe in uh, Mumbai, which has been started by, um, it's an NGO. And um, there are about 10 or 12 uh, differently abled children who work there. So she finds herself, uh, she goes there every alternate day. And that's her self-esteem because her sister is an architect and who goes to work. And me, I'm an aunt who tells stories and go to work too. So she needs to find somewhere where she can actually go to work. And she's very happy. Every alternate day when she comes back, she'll give me a call. Today, I made whatever. So we talk about food and she's just with you. She's very loving. Down syndrome children learn by observation. So I didn't know that. When she was very young, I used to comb my hair and put lipstick whenever I used to go to my sister's house in Mumbai. And after a few days, my sister used to say, hey, hello, have you been combing your hair in front of the mirror? My daughter is doing it. <laughs> so from then on, I had to watch my actions a bit more careful. And this blanket, um, I made it with crochet and I've been using it. Uh, I actually made it for my granddaughter and presented her and a few other friends also. Um, books by David Mackey, um, Elmer, and he's written a, quite a few books. So the blanket has been going around different schools also. And it's come back to me after my granddaughter says, okay, I'm done with it. My, my dolls have also played with it. So I said, yes, the story needs to continue, but in a different format. So I tried this. Mm -hmm. Please open to suggestions, open to critiques Thank where you. I can improve. Thank you so much for bringing this. What a heartwarming tale, my God. Elmer is one of her favorites too. And how you brought in, you know, it's okay to being different and it's okay to being accepted as a different person. It's so beautiful. And yes, Veena, the need of the hour, how many other times we keep bringing in awareness, it is never, never enough. And I think it was, it was through such a beautiful story of Elmer. And now, my God, I love that quilt because Elmer came into my eyes when, uh, you know, you showed me the quilt. So beautiful. And thank you so much. I will never forget Elmer and Nandini ever. Thank you so much. And kudos for being that wonderful aunt. Kudos. Patience and love. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So now we'll. Hi, can I say something? Yes, yes go ahead. Uh, I have a problem also. I'm physically uh, disabled. Uh, my left leg, and uh, I have some power in my right leg. Uh, but it was not like that. Like, uh, uh, my fourth January. Uh, after my fourth delivery, I got a uh, tumor in my spine. So, what was the best that I'm still alive and still able to move with the support? So, that was the best I could do. So, I could just relate to Nandani and I loved, I love it. <laughs> no, after, uh, I would like to uh, communicate with her if she allows. <laughs> So that's it. Great. Okay. Um, let us uh, let us proceed. Uh, Eniko, are you ready? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Eniko is in. You are in Transylvania. Correct? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. And uh, the, I have learned from you that Transylvania is inside Romania. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'm fascinated that you call Transylvania the, the garden of fairies. Yes, uh, it's not my, not my idea. <laughs> Long time ago, some writers just, just fixed this. Uh -huh. <laughs> Of course, you know, in the in the USA, my old home, Transylvania is known in relation to the, the, 
uh, vampire. Yes, yes. So the I Dracula was, story is the. <laughs> yeah. So I was happy that it's uh, also associated with uh, with fairies. Yes, yes. Okay, it's the, so, it's the so, best association, I think. Yes. <laughs> Better than the vampire. <laughs> story. How did that vampire connection come about? <laughs> you know? It's a long story with a with a historical uh, past. So, mm -hmm. um, there was some time ago uh, a man who was um, so cruel that. Um, after his death, uh, some legends just arrived. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so now um, please introduce yourself and uh, and your location uh, fully, and um, and 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 please tell us the title of your story, and and please tell us a story. Thank you, Eric. My name is Sabu Aniku. Aniku. I'm called Aniku. I'm a story therapist, a storyteller and uh, also working with uh, special needs kids. And um, I'm from uh, Romania, Transylvania, exactly from Shepsi Sandjurd. And uh, my story came from Siberia, from a, from a very um, unknown tribe of the Evenkis. And I don't know what title to give it to. Uh, it would be Lotirko, okay? So, Egyszer volt, Huenem volt, once upon a time, there was a flying man, and his name was Lotirko. Lotiko flew over the oceans, the green lands, high up to the sky, just flying joyfully. But one Monday, probably, he flew too far from home. This was not the first time. So the night began and he had to search for a shelter. And unfortunately, he knocked on Tevente's door. So unlucky for him. Tevente was hospitable. He gave the best dishes and uh, the good foods, the best dishes served in the world by his wife. Then, he showed the guest room and Lotilko was very, very thankful. Tevente saw through the half open door how Lotilko detaches his wings and hanged it on the chair. From that moment, he could not find his peace of mind. Why somebody needs when he, he has hands, why in earth needs wings? With the hands, he can walk, he can touch, he can catch. With the legs, he can walk. Why in earth somebody needs wings? He was so upset, couldn't find his peace of mind until he stole the wings from Lotilko. At sunrise, Lotilka rose up and searched everywhere where the wings are, but he couldn't find them. So he ran from the house and he saw Tevente. Tevente was ready to go to hunt. And he just shouted, Tevente, stop, please give me back my wings. And Tevente said, okay, I will give it back when I'm returned. Laughed and went away. Lotilko then searched in the house, outside the house. After that, he begged to the wife, please, please give my wings back. I wanna go home. 
but the wife was so afraid of Tevente, her husband, that she haven't given it back. Oh, Latoya Kosova is so hopeless and so sad. She went to search it in the forest. And he saw the birds of the skies. And he was just praying to fly. And then he asked the birds, hey birds, can you help me to find my wings? And they said, okay, yes, yes, I will. And we will help you in a moment. You just hunt us a deer, you offer it to us. And after that, we will help. So Lotilko went to a hunt and gave them a huge reindeer. And in a few minutes, just the white bones were lying on the ground. So Lotilko asked again about the wings and they said, you just search it on the left side and on the right side of the river. This is our answer. Lotilko became so angry for being treated like this. He cursed them furiously. This was, a, this was a, an ultimate curse. And he said, all birds from here to have curved toes. So the curse worked from that time until nine, until now this kind of birds are called curved toe jackdaws. Latilko returned when he hoped Tevente got home from the hunt, asked him, begged him to give back the wings, but Tevente never wanted to give it back. So in one moment, he saw Lotilko's new boots and asked for him, uh, from, for them instead. And Lotilko was thinking, okay, Tevente, I could give you my boots because if I have my wings, who needs boots? So he gave the boots, but Tevente was laughing and haven't returned the wings. But now Lotilko haven't had boots and it was a frozen winter, a snowy winter. So he went to the village and asked the people for some boots, some shoes, anything. But all of them were so afraid from Tevente, nobody gave him boots. Then in that moment, Lotilko just realized nobody will help him, nobody. He cannot trust or rely on nobody but himself. So he went again back to the forest and began to gather feather by feather all what he needed for the new wings. So it was a hard work, feather by feather, just imagine. But eventually ended. And when the wings was, were ready, he put it, he attached to his shoulders and he began to fly. And before flying home, he went again to Tevente's house, flying, just to say goodbye. Tevente and his wife was surprised. They couldn't understand what's happening. Hey, Lotilko, what are you doing? 
I'm going home. I just wanted to say goodbye, said Lutilko. And he was flying, flying, upper and upper. And Tevente, seeing Lutilko's flying, felt an irresistible desire to fly. And he said to his wife, hey, woman, give these wings to me. I want to fly too. And the woman brought the wings and he attached to his shoulders, but he couldn't fly. He couldn't rise up from the ground. He was just like a sick chicken. He couldn't rise up from the ground. In the meantime, Lotilko was rising, rising. First, he was like a big, big bird after like a little, little bird, then just a dot on the sky and disappeared. And I hope until now he arrived home. Okay, thank you. That was very beautiful. Thank you very much. So flying was a very important uh, element of that story. Yes. Flying can, my associations with flying are um, freedom and um, uh, th th that I can control my own destiny. <coughs> is that, is that, are there other, do you have other associations with flying? Anybody? So Eniko, I saw on your bio data, you are you are a story therapist of a particular um, method, the metamorphosis yes. metamorphosis creative development fairy tale therapy. Yes. Can you say a word about that and how that could how how could that relate to the story you just told? Uh, uh, it could relate to every story. <laughs> okay. Well, just tell us Especially, about especially uh, the method is. Um, um, Buldijar Ildiko's method, uh, who developed this um, metamorphosis um, method, and uh, relies on the on the basics of um, every story, folk tale, uh, fairy tale. It's um, it's a, re a recipe for life, hmm. and uh, following the hero or the heroine uh, and um, making the wandering parts of the story, uh, we also can uh, resolve our problems. How to explain more generally. Um, in a story, there are uh, maximum two, uh, three, maximum three developing stories, mm -hmm. but mostly one. It's one uh, hero's developing way. And uh, one problem or two and the resol resolution of, of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric, you must ask me uh, because I will be <laughs> confusing <laughs> everybody. Well, that's okay. No, I, you know, I, I also uh, am working with, with storytelling therapy and specifically fairy tale therapy. So uh, I'm just, uh, I'm interested that um, that there are different um, individuals and organizations around the world who are who are following a similar path. Yes, yes. There also, I'm a Hungarian living in Romania, 
in uh, I know in uh, Hungarian uh, um, uh, functioning there are three uh, methods, mm -hmm. developed methods of uh, working with uh, uh, folk tales. Mm -hmm. so and the uh, in the world there are a lot of them. So I'm so know? curious of of your. <laughs> oh, well, we'll let's let's you know we'll talk we'll we'll continue yes, the yes. conversation afterwards. And by the way, everyone, uh, the, some of the storytellers uh, they have a link to their web page uh, on the um, on the program uh, web web page. Uh, so you can, you can if you want to send an email to someone, you can probably find it there. Or if it's not there, just send an email to me, and I'll 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 put you in touch. Uh, just tell us a little bit about the, the storytelling festival that you organize. Oh, this is a beautiful thing. But I'm, uh, I'm uh, on your festival from two years since two, when I realized that it's a fascination. Mine is a little bit, um, uh, it's little, it's smaller. Mm -hmm. Was and it... it's uh, in three languages, in uh, Hungarian, Romanian, and uh, English. Hmm. And uh, it, first of all, it is because uh, I want to uh, raise a bit the storytelling uh, culture. Because it's, it's um, a bit uh, uh, unknown. There are villages where are living um uh, storytellers but it's not a not a common thing to be a storyteller mm -hmm. so the ancient tradition has really dwindled and uh and the revival is coming along slowly yes yes very slowly this will be the seventh uh, festival of mine in mm -hmm. september this year and it's it's very slow but um i think it's okay <laughs> I have to be happy with what I have. And uh, I have um, uh, invited even from uh, England, from um, Hungary, and also Romanian storytellers to this festival. Uh, uh, always depends on the financial <laughs> mm -hmm. part, how and what I can afford. And uh, these two years, uh, which were in uh, online, it were it, the world became bigger, mm -hmm. and uh, we could touch a lot more people worldwide. Mm -hmm. It was a interesting uh, uh, experience for me mm. and for the festival. I think. Great. Uh, Kajal, did you uh, want to say something? Kajal, you had your hand raised. Yes, yes. Go uh, ahead. So when when uh, I was hearing the story and the way the protagonist or the main hero was trying uh, to get his wings back, you know, from the, uh, the different ways he tried, my I put it in the chat also. My heart skipped when he realized the part when she said he when he realized that no one is going to help him and that's where you know i felt now what you know the story you feel like now what you know and it was such a beautiful way she took us you know to the part where uh, i have to help myself that's what uh, i think it's, it's it was a beautiful story and i loved it it somehow uh, relates to it doesn't matter which country you are in self-help is the best help that was the line always told uh, to me as a child you know by my father and this story actually uh, tells that you know self-help is the best help thank you so much for sharing the beautiful story thank you very much uh barry yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, Eric, it took me a minute to get my thoughts together. But when you asked about when you talked about your connections with flying and your associations and freedom, um, that two stories came to mind during the telling. One of them, of course, is the story of Narcissus, uh, not Narcissus, I'm sorry, of Daedalus and Icarus and, and, you know, having freedom, but flying too far beyond your reach. 
And another is um, a story that I tell sometimes as kind of a cautionary tale that I use with um, middle school students. And it's from the Navajo tradition in the southwestern United States. And it's called the Eagle Boy. And it's about a boy who um, uh, gets a pet eagle. He finds a little eagle and becomes obsessed with it and stops being part of the community. And then the eagle has to fly away. And the boy begs to go with the eagle. And the boy goes to Eagle Land and becomes an eagle. And, he, and he's given wings. But then he disobeys and he loses his wings and it's about kind of being in the middle ground and it's a little about obsession, even about addiction, something that looks very attractive at first, but if you abuse it um, and it, it consumes you. But some of those same motifs of having wings and losing your wings and mm -hmm. trying to get your wings back are in that story as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Well, shall we proceed to the next uh, telling? Uh, yes. Uh, and um, and we definitely will talk about fairy tale therapy, Aniko. I, I hope. Thank I hope you for the opportunity. Thank you for of listening. Course. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sandia, are you ready? Yes, Eric. Okay, please uh, introduce yourself fully. Tell us where you're telling from. Tell us the title of your story and please tell us a story. Yes, thank you, Eric. Good evening, everyone. Myself, Sandhya Naren. I live near Mangalore, but right now I'm on holidays in my hometown in Cochin, Kerala. So I'm going to tell a story written by my banker colleague, Vijita Vijay Kumar in Malayalam which is translated and modified by me to suit the storytelling narrative. So here goes the story. The title of the story is The Purpose of Life Found at Near Death. Here goes the story. As Aneshwara got into the bus and took a seat, it started drizzling. She put the window shutter half closed, allowing the raindrops to touch her cheeks and to feel cool. And soon she lost in her thoughts. Anishwara was a 24 year old young girl who had just escaped from RCC Trivandrum, that is Regional Cancer Center, the biggest cancer hospital in Kerala. Yes, she was a cancer patient diagnosed with bone cancer in her last stage, counting her days. Even doctors had given up their hope and written off her cards. She had only her mother who was taking care of her, who was with her all the time as though protecting her from the evil eyes of the death. She was married and had a good life until she was diagnosed with this illness. The one who took a marriage vow that they'll be together until their last breath broke off soon after, soon after seeing her medical reports. So for the past two months, she was confined in the hospital room undergoing treatments after treatment. Then one day, she felt that I should go out. I should escape myself from this hospital atmosphere, from the scary visuals of death and disease and pain and suffering, and from the smell of this antiseptic lotions and that all, and from the bitterness of medicines, bitter medicines. Let me go out and see the world. Let me experience the warmth of the sunshine. Let me experience the cool moonlight. Let me touch the snow, snowflakes. Let me see the rain, feel the rain and everything. In one day, one day morning, from the eyes of her mother and from the hospital staff, she just ran away. She took her bag and ran away out of the hospital. And without even looking at the board of the bus, she got into the bus. And soon, she's here. Kanyakumari, Kanyakumari. She woke up from the 
loud noise of the bus conductor. Yes, she reached the holy place of Kanyakumari, the southernmost part of India, the holy place, which is known as, which has Triveni Sangamam, that is the joining of three oceans, three seas. She got out of the bus, went to a nearby lodge, and which is a cheap lodge because she had little money. She hired a room. And as soon as she saw the bed, she hit the bed. She was very tired. She slept off. It was a deep sleep. She forgot everything. When she woke up from the sleep, it was already evening. She was very hungry. Not only that, as Aneshwara had missed that day's treatment and medicines, already pain started growing up and her legs started swelling up. Still, she took a shower and she went down. There were street vendors selling snacks and food eateries. She went at one of the counter and ate tattu dosha, a small type of dosha, which costed only 20 rupees. After eating that, she felt so good. She was thinking, why did I do this so late? I would have done this early. I feel so good to be free. I was always protected by my either by my parents or by my husband. I am I was always told never to go out and roam around freely. People will stare at you. No, now I am free and I'm feeling good. Still, she was wondering, as I'm nearing my death, what would be the purpose of my remaining life? Whatever it is, let me enjoy my life the way I want. Thinking so. She went to the, uh, to the temple, the famous Kanyakumari temple. She just had one desire to see and uh, stand in front of goddess Kanyakumari. As she stood in front of the idol of Lord goddess Kanyakumari Devi with folded hands, she didn't know what to ask, what to pray. Should she ask, give me a long life or Take, uh, end my misery and end my life so soon. She didn't know what to pray. So she just stood there. Do you know the nose ring which is worn by Kanyakumari Devi? The race of which is enough to distract the far away uh, sh uh, ship captain, ship people. That is what it is heard. So she just enjoyed the beauty of the goddess and she came back. She came to the beach, Kanyakumari beach. And she sat there thinking something. She heard a sound. Kainokanama uh, means there appeared an astropalmist, a fortune teller, an old lady. She came and asked for her left hand. Anishwara laughed within her mind. What would this fortune teller would tell me, who, to me, who doesn't even know whether I'll wake up tomorrow or no? Still, she raised her hand. The palmist looked at her um, hand and said, Oh, your Vidya Reka is too long, which means you are highly educated. It was correct. She was a PhD holder. Then she said, You have a government job, Reka also. That is also true. She had got a government job, which she had resigned due to her illness. Then the lady said, are you married? Um, but you have some problems in your marriage. I think so. Yes, that also seems to be true. So that's all the lady concluded and she paid her fees. She asked, Anishwara asked, since you have told me this much, can you tell me how long will I live? Aha, uh -huh. nobody can tell no, no, to nobody how many days they will live. But looking at you, I can tell one thing. Even after so many years, you can be here and you can see Goddess Kanyakumari Devi. That's all I can say. Saying this, she left. Anishwara laughed. Again, she lost in her thoughts. She looked around. She saw families, children playing with their parents in the beach. Then she remembered her mother. Oh my God. My mother must be already searching for me. She must be sad and panic. 
how i wish if i would have given her someone after my death whom she can look after that is a child born through me that is a grandchild at least i would have given her that as she lost in her thoughts she heard another voice malippu vena ma malippu she looked there stood a small girl a 7 to 8 year old young girl in shabby clothes selling flowers she said yes give me two strands two strands means you know half hand length as the girl was cutting and giving the flower anishwaran that the girl is blind she asked uh, where do you stay who all are there in your family i don't have anybody in my family i just stay with the street children but without seeing how you i got used to this akka not only that doctor and to auntie told me if anybody donates their eye i can see anishara paid the cost of the flowers and the girl started walking away then at that moment anishara got a sudden flash of thought she stood up already her body was aching still she ran with all her might she held the hand of malli that young girl and she took her and ran to the hotel room she checked out took her bag and ran out and came to the bus stand she got into the bus with malli nearby and she took two tickets back to rcc trivandrum and that time in the, uh, for the first time in past many days she prayed she prayed within her mind that until i reach near my mother and give this girl's hand to her and saying that she will be there for you after i leave and seeing through my eyes until then please let me live that was her prayer and her heart was jumping with joy that she found a purpose of her life at this time for the remaining life and her name anashwara means eternal so this was my story thank you thank you thank you very much thank you arik Hmm. So the purpose of her life was to help somebody else. Yes. Mhm. Mm Not just to help to donate a part of her body, you know, it can be an organ um which means you are giving life to another person and that person is living um you a part of you is living through someone. Mhm. Mm so maybe that was her purpose. Despina, what have you written in the chat section? Want to, you want to say it out loud? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it's just that the wishing part. It made me think of several tales that involve people wishing for something and then regretting it because they are not very sure of what they should be wishing for or they haven't given it a second thought. So this lady, already, the heroine, already had the chance. when she was in front of the statue of the goddess she had the chance of wishing for something but she didn't because she didn't know what to wish for then and it was only later on in life that it was a wise thought that made her realize exactly what was worth wishing so i just said that i commented that it was a sign of wisdom mm -hmm. yes thank you despina thank you for the story Thank you. So is that a uh, is that a story that was composed by somebody or is it a true story or No, it's a fiction story but uh, she wrote it out of uh, the experiences shared by her friends, you know. Mm. Um somebody's experience, some mm -hmm. part of experience and some part imaginary. Mm. Mm -hmm. because not all cancer patients can donate their eyes 
Mm. So that part I am yet to research upon. I think blood cancer patients cannot donate. Mm. So, you know, that uh, technical part is yet to be researched upon. Mm -hmm. But it's a good thing that, you know, if somebody is uh, near to that, they have to uh, somehow convince themselves or uh, uh, that they can live through somebody else. It's a good thing, uh, you know, all of us, you know, all of us some way or the other, we wish that, you know, people should remember us in some way. Mm -hmm. So maybe this part touched me. Mm. Very nice, Sandhya. Thank I, you I so much. I was reminded of my dad because my dad always says that we need to donate eyes and he has helped so many people donate eyes. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to because he passed away due to COVID. But then I, I already have it in my mind. And very recently, I also came across a WhatsApp forward. I'm not sure if it is true, but the story that it carried was so beautiful. And I was reminded of that story when you said this. It was about a Brazilian millionaire who suddenly announced that he is going to bury his, uh, you know, very, very expensive car. And uh, people were all uh, talking bad about him, telling him that he doesn't understand the value of the money and he's burying the car and how is it and all that. It has got ex uh, expensive parts and uh, he's just showing off his money. But then on the day that he had announced the burial, he just said that I just wanted to tell you that if you're getting so angry that I'm going to bury an expensive car, then most of us are getting buried just like that. When we have so many valuable parts in us, which can be put to use by many other people. So uh, it, it just brought to me uh, that story, which I read and I think it's a very, very important story that needs to be shared and everybody should be at some point. We cannot force anybody to do it, but it, it's, uh, it yeah. might touch people to do something nice. So thank you for bringing that story. Yes, Lavanya, thank you so much. Absolutely, we should, you know, even after death, we can contribute to somebody. It's, it's really a great thing, you know. While alive, we can do a lot of things, but even after leaving this world, if we can do something to somebody, it's only through this organ donation. Very true. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now we'll proceed to the final storyteller of the evening, and that is Nidhi. Nidhi, please uh, introduce yourself fully. Uh, tell us where you're telling from. Please tell us the title of your story, and then please tell us a story. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nidhi Sahigal, and I'm from uh, Faridabad, Haryana, India. That's a small city near New Delhi. So I'm from NCR, and uh, I'm a professional story healer. Uh, being a life coach and a therapist, you know, we need to tell stories to our clients sometimes to heal them. Not sometimes, very often stories really touch them you know so I you know keep on picking up these stories which I have listened from my grandparents maybe mythology something that touched me and uh, helps more lots of my clients and uh, uh, Nidhi I, if you, I, I think it will help if you move the microphone a little bit away from your chin yeah, you so can't it hear me you can't yeah, hear me? It, it shouldn't touch your skin because when oh, it I'm touches sorry. your skin, yeah. Okay. okay, go ahead. So I'm a professional story healer, a therapist, and a Reiki specialist. And my journey started when I separated from my husband seven years back. I was into depression, panic attacks, irritated bowel syndrome. And I lost my life. And then uh, universe sent me a therapist. She pulled me out. She taught me that you have to take charge of your life. You have a daughter in front of you. And that's all my story all about. For more people around me, I really don't want a lot of them suffering. Like I wasted seven years bouncing back in life. I really want to tell more people don't waste seven years. I wasted. And now I hold hands for many people and help them bounce back in life and take charge of their life. And I've learned in my journey that we are 100% responsible for whatever happens in our life. 
instead you know we go the depression lane of blaming being the victims you know so i feel the power to bounce back in life is with inside us wherever we look outside so this is all my story is all about a very small short story hope it will touch your heart and uh, please excuse me because i'm not a pro and uh, i'll just start with my story the name is take charge of your life yeah so i'll start with the story the scene is inside the room of a therapist i'm not sure i can do this at all in fact how can i live my life how will i live alone it's not possible you know i can it's a marriage of 20 years alia murmured with tears rolling down her cheeks swollen eyes shivering hands getting hysterical breathless her therapist holding her hand alia first take a long deep breath relax your body remember i told you count till 5 4 3 2 1 and anchor a good thought the moment you will anchor a good thought you'll calm your body stop shivering my sweet heart stop shivering take charge of your life take charge of your life take charge of your life dear coach i cannot do it how will i survive no house no job i have a daughter to take care of i want to end my life here and she expressed her hidden fears and the therapist says alia what do you mean that you cannot live your life without him is he an oxygen cylinder for you look at yourself you have a daughter to take care of she has a future come on take charge of your life take charge of your life and I, i understand life has thrown you at the crossroads alia take charge of your life take charge of your life take charge of your life how can i tell my friends what will people say what will my parents say what will the principal say alia stop worrying what people say they are not going to bring food to your house they are not going to take care of your daughter come on take charge of your life again how can i tell my friends her body was shivering she had no energy to even pick up a glass of water and drink she was restless but deep down in her mind her inner voice was saying take charge take charge take charge and the voice of the therapist was you know bouncing back alia you have two choices either be weak or be strong choose your path if you will choose the weakest path you are going to be stuck in your life if you are going to choose the strongest path you are going to bounce back in life i leave it to you choose your path take charge of your life take charge of your life alia take charge of your life she was tired her legs were weary she was sweating but reflecting on the thoughts what the therapist was telling her she started her journey she started taking her therapist lessons day by day she started meditating she started deep breathing she started walking on the ground they said grounding helps mother earth pulls down your electrons oh i never knew that alia thought let me try this and she started grounding herself every day she started deep breathing deep down the voices of a therapist were going on come on send happy thoughts to your brain you're sending sad thoughts and the brain is sending you know sad chemicals come on fight back fight back let the happy chemicals flow take charge of your life alia take charge of your life you're carrying too many burdens the burden of your past the burden of your past mistakes the past traumas alia take charge of your life one by one start leaving all these baggages 
they are wearing you down. They are wearing you down. Alia, take charge of your life. And deep down, these voices were getting louder, louder and louder every day because Alia started taking charge of her life, you know. She started going out. She came out of her cocoon. She was not afraid anymore to meet the people and look into their eyes and said, yes, I can take charge of my life. Stop judging me. Because she remembered her grandfather saying, if you point fingers at others, the three fingers are towards you. She remembered that. And that's how she started bouncing back in life. And Alia realized it's time to listen to these voices. It's time to listen to these voices whispering in her ears. You are tired. You need to drop the load, Alia. You need to fix it. Come on, bounce back, bounce back. Take charge of your life. It was until Alia let go of all these bags, you know, one by one, day by day, one by one. She started coming out of life. She, she started smiling. She started enjoying her passion that was cooking. She started enjoying telling stories around. Wow. She realized when she tells stories, in these stories, she's healing people and she's also getting healed. Wow. This is magical. Stories being sent to her. And that's how she created a peace inside her life. And once the peace was created inside, her outward word, her outside word also became so peaceful, so calm. And that is how she took charge of her life. Alia took charge of her life and she bounced back in her life. This is the story all about taking charge of your life. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. So thank that you. becomes a becomes a mantra. Take charge of your life. Take charge of your life. Yes. Hmm. I give this message to all my clients who come for therapy now to me. Because, you know, you cannot be a healer if you can, haven't gone through it. I personally feel mm -hmm. you can more relate to them. And what all things you did wrong, you can at least, you know, hold their hands and not let them go to that same path. And uh, as a life coach, I'm trying to do that in my own little way, telling stories, pulling them out, holding their hands the way my therapist did it with me. So this was a message I wanted to convey to everybody. Life is beautiful. We have to honor our life. Don't let it go like this down the drain. Thank you. Anybody, any thoughts, comments, questions? Well, it certainly resonates with the earlier story about um... Self-reliance. Uh, Barry, can you be a little louder somehow? Of course. It certainly resonates with the earlier story about self-reliance and putting on your own wings, you know, and that, that take charge of your life is like putting on your own wings and flying on your own. You know, uh, during this pandemic, the anxiety, the fear, the depression is on the rise, you know, especially after the post pandemic, when people have lost their jobs, lost their careers. So I, we often find, you know, people getting into depression. So I really want through this uh, platform, want to tell people, sometimes you even don't know you're depressed, you know, you keep saying uh, everything is fine in my life. All is well, all is well, all is well. But deep down, you don't know. But there are certain symptoms which I went through, you know, excessive eating, putting on a lot of weight, you know, and still I was telling people I'm not depressed. I'm not sad. You know, there's little, little things. So what is uh, clinical depression 
if we start, it's you know actually not sending oxygen to your brain. If we start doing it little by little, little by little, you know, the situation doesn't get worse. If we catch it in the initial stages. So, you know what, our brain is the chemical factory and everything is happening here, you know, and it's all about changing the chemicals, you know, and if we can learn this and we can tell this to stories, what better platform we have and telling people. So I really want to say stories definitely heal lives and people can relate it more better, you know, and the stories always keep going like the character Alia. The little voice was, you know, going on in her brain, you know, Alia, bounce back. Alia, drop your baggage. Alia, bounce back. Drop your past. Don't get into victimhood. You know, it's over. Move on, move on, move on. So these little voices are little stories inside us. So even our self-talk really matters, you know. What are you talking? The self-talk, is it a self-sabotizing behavior? You know, are we in shame? Are we in guilty? Are we cribbing? Are we crying? Or are we looking at the brighter side of life? It really matters. And Alia bounced back when she changed her messages to the brain. Thank you so much, Eric, for this wonderful platform. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, as someone said in the chat section, the, the stories tonight seem to be interwoven somehow. They seem to be on a similar theme of um, of um, uh, surviving, surviving and thriving. Does anyone want to say anything before we before we hang up? And how this happened without none of us knowing what stories we're going to tell to each other is amazing. <laughs> so that's that's something so magical for me. So thank you, everyone who shared the gift of the story that you had with us. Uh, lovely evening. Thank you, Eric, for organizing this. Thank you. OK, so uh, we'll say good night and good afternoon. and. Uh, You'll get a notice. This will be this will be up on uh, YouTube soon. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.